followed by followed by our multi zones okay so we'll talk about uh, single zones first and then our next segment would be our multi zones and then we will we will have the time for question and answers so so in our single zones we have the WKUA models that uh, got released early last year, or I would say late in 2019. And uh, we have been going well with this product. And uh, recently uh, they got upgraded and now they can be connected uh, with our three zone, only our three zone uh, multi-zone system. Then we have, we will talk about our existing exterior single zone that ends with an RKUA. This TS Charlie Sam stands for the indoor section and the CU stands for the outdoor section. Okay. So always remember when you're pairing these units, when you're pairing these models, always make sure the inside and the outside ends with RKUA or WKUA. Then we have the RE uh, uh, Pro Series. We call the builder model very strong, very powerful. In our residential lineup, we have the wall mounted, ducted, and cassettes. So if you have an application where you want to put in a wall mounted, we have the 9,000, 12, 18, 24, 30, and 36 on the single zones. But when you go into multi zones, we start from 5,000, 7,000, 9, 12, 18, 24, and that's it. We have uh, single zones. Remember that, okay? Once again, we have single zones that start with 9,000, and we and we have multi zones that starts with the 5,000, which we will talk later. So if your application is calling for a wall mounted, well and good, you have wall mounted there. If it's calling for ducted, you can use ducted. If you have a cassette application, mostly in restaurants, I have seen them, you can go for that. So you have choices there. So the WKUA, the unit that was released early uh, last year or late 2019, it has this technology, the Dano X technology. It has a built-in Wi-Fi. So all you have to do is download the app and get connected. You can control it wherever you are, whichever part of the world you are in. It, it comes with a wireless remote controller. And if your client, customer, homeowner wants a wired remote control, no problem. You can use that. The RKUA. The, the existing units, models that we had for a for few years now, has a built-in Econavi sensor. This Econavi sensor is not built in, the, in, the, in our newest models, the, the WKUA. But the older ones, which we are still selling, and, 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 and it will never be discontinued, it has the Econavi sensor. And if you are looking for a, a Wi-Fi option, you can always have Wi-Fi connected from our third-party Intersys. We'll talk about that later. Intersys talks to our units, and you can download their app, and everything is up and running as easy as it can be. I threw in here easy error code retriever because, trust me, our models, our products, very easy, super easy, super, super easy to retrieve the error code that means if you if your customer is calling you for a problem and they are telling you the timer light is blinking you can always ask them to retrieve the error code that way you as a technician are well prepared are well prepared maybe uh, pass by your supplier and on your way to the homeowner's residence auxiliary heater you can use an auxiliary heat option just in case you are living in a very cold area, a super, super cold area that snows a lot, gets cold a lot, uh, 
and in in most cases it's like up north areas so what is this auxiliary heat about there is a plug where you can plug in and it produces 12 volts dc those 12 volts dc you can take it and energize a hot water coil or a boiler or a baseboard heater that's what it's all about the nano x which is our current model that we are selling and it's and it's booming like crazy it has this function that takes away the odor attacks mold pollen bacteria viruses but you must make sure that you turn on you you, make, you must make sure that you turn on the, uh, the the function for nano x on your remote controller you will see nano x you must turn it on it will take care of all this and keep your room nice and fresh nano x technology brings natural cleaning properties of hydroxyl radicals to the environment it inhibits certain allergens bacteria viruses up to 99.9 percent .9%. mind you this has been tested in our labs okay panasonic has got good very uh, reputation when it comes to air purifying so please keep that in mind this unit they have designed it in a in a in a very good looking style it looks super super good they have reduced the thickness or the or the width at the top and even though they have reduced the top it has the same energy efficiency where the coil receives hot air or cold air depending on which season you are and does the heat exchange okay the louvers will open there are two louvers the the vertical and the horizontal the, the louver that, that goes up and down and the other louver that goes side to side left to right let's talk in a brief let's talk briefly about uh, inverter technology now most of our central acs are not inverter technology most of them are on and off they run at 60 hertz when they are satisfied they shut off but with these heat pumps they are they are having a compressor and a board over there on top that drives this compressor up and down frequency up and down depending on the on your load so in this case if if we have less load the compressor will hardly turn you see the load is only two people hardly generating any heat so the compressor is hardly running okay but when that same compressor is told by the sensors inside the room that hey the load has increased we need more juice we need more heat we need more cooling compressor starts running like crazy but it will not run like crazy forever like a central ac system it will run for a few minutes maybe a maximum of 10 minutes before it starts settling down and it will settle down and it will keep at a constant uh, frequency and try and, and maintain a very good uh, cooling uh, comfort level if not cooling heating but comfort level so it will regulate a little bit up and down at some point but at the same time targeting your set temperature so what tells what tells the compressor to ramp up and down the compressor is getting that information from the sensors at the indoor unit the sensors tell the outdoor pcb hey i need more refrigerant or i need less refrigerant so that that info is sent to this electronic expansion valve some people say linear expansion valve you can name it whatever you feel like naming back in the day it was a fixed orifice or a fixed cap tube a capillary tube now they have become more creative and now we have electronic controlled electronically and how it's been controlled as i said it's controlled by the sensors at the indoor unit at the outdoor unit so when there is more, more uh, when, when there is a, when there is a requirement for more refrigerant this this electronic expansion valve tends to open a bit more it opens more and more and more and then and then once it once the room is satisfied 
or getting to set point, it starts regulating it and, and starts to close. Eventually, it will close down completely and the compressor is going to go off. So what is this solenoid all about? I need you to understand what's inside this solenoid valve so that one, when you are replacing it for whatever reason, not the coil, but the body, when you are replacing it for whatever reason, I want you to understand what is inside so that you are careful when you're brazing, okay? So when you look inside, when we take a cut, a cut piece, we cut it into half and we see a, a side view of what's inside, there is a guide there, okay? And then there is a shaft, plastic rotor. Can you imagine this whole piece here? It's, 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 it's a huge, I mean, they put a big piece here of plastic. Now, when you're brazing down here, you got to be careful. You got to be careful of this plastic rotor. Many guys have done it without putting a, a, a cold cloth, a damp cloth. And guess what? This thing got melted and got stuck. And then when they, when they turn the unit on, nothing is happening. Same problem. So, so, so when it happened, guess what? If I'm the technician, I'm going to say, you told me to change that and I have the same problem again. But you forgot to tell me that when you're replacing that rotor, uh, sorry, that uh, electronic expansion valve, you forgot to put cold water. I mean, sorry, a damp cloth, a cold damp cloth. So please remember, regardless of electronic expansion valves, coils, whatever you, whenever you are doing a joint, whenever you are brazing a joint, it's always important to have a damp cloth. Always damp it, in, uh, dip it in, in cold water, squeeze it a little bit and, and wrap it around. This is the old fashion. Nowadays they have, they have uh, sprays, they have uh, paste, uh, you name it. So please use it so that there is no much heat being transferred elsewhere and damaging stuff. I had a guy change a compressor and by mistake, uh, he didn't see the sensor at the back, the thermistor at the back, and he blew off the thermistor. He burnt the thermistor. So, so that can be a problem as well. So you you got to be very careful. No rush, guys. No rush. After the plastic rotor, we have a valve pin bay. All these components can cause trouble if, when replacing, you are not taking uh, a, a serious uh, a thought of using a wet, a wet cloth. That's, a, that, that's your valve chamber. That's your stopper. A lot of components, a lot of components. Now, now there is, a, there, there is a call for cooling. We are in cool mode and the unit is, is calling for cooling. Refrigerant starts to flow. It's at minimum slightly open you saw the flow is like like the earlier slide i showed you with only two people okay guys this call is when the compressor is running at a very low frequency and when the load is very low it hardly moves but when there is more call let's say you set the temperature very uh, very low in cooling now it's opening more and now it's at max and when it's at max just watch the flow of refrigerant it's flowing like crazy back in the day we could not do this we could not do this because we didn't have the technology at that time and also we were operating on a fixed flow of refrigerant whether in heating or in cooling so we would size the capillary tube length depending on the capacity. In this case, we have different different types, different different sizes of electronic expansion valves. So not any and every electronic valve will work with any unit. They go based on, on the capacity. They need to talk to each other. So if you have a situation where you're calling, for full load, you're calling for maximum open. 
but the unit is not opening well, you could be having a problem with your refrigerant. You could be having a problem with a coil, or you could be having problem with the valve body itself. Always remember, guys, when you're changing the compressor for whatever reason, always flush the coil, always flush the condenser coil, blow the condenser coil, all, remove all the crap. But before you do that, get this valve body out of the equation. Get this valve body out of the unit. Then you flush the system and then put it back. Because I'll tell you, all that crap that you're flushing out of that coil can come and get stuck here very easily. Back in the day, when we had a compressor burnout, to be successful, we would change the cap tube. Because it's very hard to flush a, cap, uh, a capillary tube. It's not, it's not that it's not possible, it's possible. But it's, it was very difficult. And, and it was not expensive. So we would just replace it and move on. And the system would perform as good as new with a, with, uh, with a new compressor and a new cap tube. So in this case, always remember to do that. Get this out of the equation, flush the coil, blow off the coil, then put this back. So inverter technology. Inverter technology is not complicated, guys. In a simple term or, the, or, the, or the terminology, AC gets converted to DC, and then DC gets again converted to AC, and that's how you drive this compressor. Sometimes I would ask my guys, what voltage do we expect here at UVW? They would say DC volts. No, it's wrong. It's AC. If you measure between U, V, V, W, W, U, you will get a balanced voltage. You should get a balanced voltage. If you don't get a balanced voltage, this board is tossed. This board is defective. And this voltage will never be stable. It will always ramp up and down. The voltage will always go up, down, up, down, depending on the load, depending on the call for heat or cool indoors. It starts around 28, 30 volts AC, and it climbs all the way to 200. When it's at 200, 208 volts DC AC, it, its frequency is like super, super high, maybe at 70 or 80 hertz. And when, it's at, and when it stabilizes and the compressor is running at a comfort level, normally it's around 40, 42, 43 hertz. So AC 208, 230 comes in, it gets converted to DC around 280 to 3, 310 volts DC to convert into AC and get you three, three phase. Yes, this compressor is running on three phase. And if, and if there is three phase coming here and the voltage is balanced and the compressor is not running, then the compressor is stuck. Anytime, anytime we have a problem with the compressor or with the outer unit, this IPM here is going to release an error code sending to the inside unit, and that EEPROM is going to tell you that you, we have an error code. F99, F96, F93, F90 are all related to compressor or outdoor PCB. And the good thing nowadays, the whole outdoor unit has only one PCB, so it makes your life easy. No time to waste. Replace that outdoor PCB and move on. Some people will, will carry an inverter checker, a phase inverter checker. If you type, if you type phase inverter checker on YouTube, on YouTube or, or Google, you will see what that component is. I will show you later on uh, at the end of the slides uh, what it looks like and, 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 and what it does. It, it saves a lot of your time. As a technician, who has lots of service calls to make, that tool will save a lot of your time and it's not even expensive.
So for the existing units, for the existing models, that ends with an RKUA, which, which ends with an RKUA, they have a built-in Econavi sensor. Econavi sensor is a human activity sensor. It measures the distance of around 120 degrees and 20 feet, 21 feet further at all the angles. It checks where is your movement, where in that room there is more activity than the other section. Maybe you're on a treadmill. Maybe you're playing with the kids and you're making movement. So that unit, if it's in Econavi mode, it will focus only on one section and take and it will take care of good comfort either cooling or heating so economic function i also use it as a night setback i like using this function as a night setback because it all it it also goes down two degrees or goes up two degrees depending on which mode you are working on this sensor you will see it on the left hand side of the unit so once again don't open this wkua and say paul how come i don't see the sensor it's not in the wkua series it's in the rkua series okay guys and it's on the left hand side and if you open the newer model which is the wkua on the left hand side there is there is the nano x generator nano x generator and the wi-fi module the rkua has this module the 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 econavi sensor so please keep that in mind and if it failed which till to date till to date i have i have yet to get a single call on an h59 error code So why I use this Econavi mode as my night setback? Because when there is no movement, it drops two degrees in cooling, uh, sorry, in heating, and two degrees uh, higher in heating. It shuts off. So when you wake up in the morning, there is not too much of fighting back to get you to normal, uh, to normal temperatures, to comfort level. Many guys, uh, they think, uh, many homeowners think that a heat pump is just like a normal furnace a normal furnace will, will won't take long to catch up to to get you to your room temperature setting even if you put six seven eight degrees night night setback but with heat pump it's a lot the heat pump gets heat from the outside so when it, so the longer uh, sorry the colder it is the longer it takes to get hot to, to give you heat so please keep that in mind night setback two degrees is more than enough and if you don't like this function then if you want if you like the manual function you can always do your night setback but don't put it like five six degrees three degrees is maximum it's more than enough So this is the explanation about Econavi and, and a, a while back I talked about NanoX and the Wi-Fi module. Auto mode. Many guys prefer auto mode, but to me, I'm not a big fan of auto mode because not that because it's there, I should use it and stuff like that. No, I feel it, it's a little bit of waste of energy because few hours the unit is running in cooling and then a few hours the unit will run in heating and it will switch back and forth, back and forth. So that's not my cup of tea. But again, if the homeowner needs auto mode, it's there, you can give it to them. In auto mode, the fan, the fan speed is always fixed, okay? The fan speed will work depending on the temperature of the coil. So please keep that in mind when you select auto mode or auto fan. 
auto mode or auto fan, please keep that in mind that the fan speed is regulated by the temperature of the coil. Also keep in mind the louvers. Look at the louver. The louver will stay at that direction. Sorry, at that angle. So always keep in mind that if you think, if you think you have a problem with a fan motor or a louver, always try it in manual mode. And if it works in manual mode, that means there's nothing wrong with the louver. There's nothing wrong with the with the compressor. There's nothing wrong with the fan motor. Everything is perfect. It is working based on the temperature of the coil. The angle of the louver works based on the temperature of the coil. And if you, if you need more clarification, we can talk about it. But at the same token, it's available on our service manual. Auto swing. Auto swing is a good function, especially when homeowners are complaining about cold draft in heat mode. Because when they're complaining about cold draft, tell them to, to switch from manual to auto, auto swing. So what's going to happen? It's going to close. It's going to shut. The louvers are going to shut, close when the unit goes into defrost. But when it stays open, there are huge chances. There are big chances of the cold draft coming down when you're in manual mode. So my best, my best setting in heat mode is auto swing and auto fan, but not auto mode. But again, if you want auto mode, it's there. It's up to you. Also remember, guys, that this unit can work with a wired remote controller, but this is optional. If your cu customer is asking for a wired remote controller, no problem. You can order it, but it's optional. It comes with a cable inside the box. You can use it. If the cable is short, you can extend it. No problem. Now, don't extend it too far. 65 is more than enough. And remember, this wired remote controller has all the features that you can think of. Weekly timer, temperature swinging up and down, fans, error code, you name it. It has everything. Now, let's talk a little bit about installation. I know you guys are a pro. I understand you guys are good in everything. But this is just one of those refresher reminder courses, okay? Reminder training. We remind you not to forget sometimes, you know? So with this installation best practice, we always like to remember, to remind our guys, there is something called reload calculation, okay? Heat gain, heat loss. Everybody does that. Not only in, not only in commercial or industrial application, but also residential application. Because the 12,000 in my bedroom may be not enough in your bedroom. Or maybe it could be an oversize in your bedroom. 6,000 BTUs in my bedroom could be too small for you in your bedroom. So please keep that in mind. There are so many things involved when you're doing load calculation, load estimation. So you have to do that religiously. Because if you say, I'm going to go by the rule of thumb, 600 uh, square feet per ton, you're OK. You could be right. You could get it dead on, bang on, no problem. But in real life, that's not the way to go. That's why we have courses on heat load and heat gain all over the, all over the map. So it's important for your sales guys to do that or your technical guys to do that. After the load calculation is done, load estimation, whatever you can call it, you pick up a capacity. Then you go with a model. Then the technician will get to get to the site and decide on which location that unit will go. Fixing of the backplate, so important. 
Why I'm saying fixing of the back plate is important is because if you don't fix it properly, or if the wall is wobbly, you will lose the fan motor in less than a year. I have seen firsthand. Motors are, are cocking off less than a year. Outdoor unit, outdoor unit installation. If you're doing heating, if you're in a cold place and you're going to use this heat pump for heating, outdoor unit is so important. Avoid the unit being close to the, the a balcony or something like that, you know, where water will be flowing, water will be coming down, snow will be coming down and freezing on your unit for no reason. And if you have that kind of case, or if you have that kind of a job site, then you have no choice that build a shelter, especially on the top, so that it doesn't come in contact directly with the unit. Power supply. Always remember, power supply, you measure it twice, thrice, to make sure you've got good voltage. You don't have joint wires. Please do not join the wires. If you don't have a long enough wire, do not join it. Just go and get another wire. Save time, save your energy, and no callbacks. Always remember, guys, the, especially the installers, when you're drilling this hole, don't go straight. Don't go, don't go straight out. Give it a slope. Always give it a slope. You can go up, out straight here, but once you get into the middle wall, start slanting downwards. We need that flow of uh, sorry, uh, condensation. Condensation has to come out freely without spraying inside. Piping, torque wrenches, gas leak, vacuuming. All these things are important, guys. 300 microns, if you can achieve. Anywhere below 500 is acceptable. But 300 is amazing. So when you're doing load calculation, this is just a sample. This is just an example I'm giving you. You quickly put in your values, depending on where you're putting the unit. If it's in an office living room, a bedroom, a restaurant, all have their values. So please keep that in mind. Load calculation is so important. Guessing work is not a is not a good is not a, a good option. No matter how many years you're in the industry. Heat pumps. Heat pumps, especially when you're doing heat pumps for heating. Always make sure you have enough of room on top, guys. Because if that heat gets tra trapped over there, it's going to put that unit to sleep. That unit is going to sleep and the guy is going to get frozen. I mean, not frozen, but he's going to feel cold. He's not going to feel comfortable. And the moment he bumps up the temperature, everything is up and running. That means in most cases, that air, the hot air, that hot return air, or that warm return air got trapped over here, putting that unit to sleep outside, telling the compressor, hey, I'm satisfied. Meanwhile, the, the seating area is cold. So always keep enough of room at the top. Keep enough of room at the top. And if there is a side wall here, if there is a side wall, then move the unit more towards the left so that it has enough of room to, to return here as well as the side, the side section. Backplate, I spoke about motors. Motors are failing because the backplate is not mounted straight on the wall. The wall is wobbly. Make sure your wall is nice and straight. Then your backplate will definitely be nice and straight. You will have no issues with motors. But I have seen backplates, trouble backplates, always lose, they lose their motors less than nine months, less than eight months. Because it's not aligned, the, warp, the, the, the unit is not straight. The blower wheel is all over the map. We give them a new motor, 
After six months, they call us again. Same story. We go to the job site, we realize that the wall is not straight. In that case, you need to put a panel at the back, a nice straight square level panel, and then mount the unit on your panel. Those are, those are only for, for cases where the wall, the drywall is wobbly. Nobody uses nails here, so don't worry about this part. Out the unit. Always keep in mind, you need, you need more room on the right compared to the other areas. Why? Because you're servicing most of the time this side. So you need more room this side. At the back, 100 millimeters is okay. On the left, there's nothing much. That's why you need only 100 millimeters. But the more you, the more you give, the better. And don't line them up. Don't line them up. Maybe if you have three, four outer units, don't line them up facing each other. Uh, or else it's going to trip especially on a very cold day or especially on a very hot day. The wall hole slanted inwards can cause water, rainwater to come in. So, the, so this hole is not acceptable because it's slanting towards the unit. Not only the rain, the rain is going to come in because the guy forgot to block it, but also the drain line, the drain water is going to come in. So please keep that in mind. You need a slope like this, free flow. This is so important. Many guys forget to do that. This drain has to be at the bottom of those two pipes and the wiring. The drain line has to be the very most bottom. So that way, when when condensation is taking place, it it it's, it it quickly sends out all that condensation without dripping here inside. These are minor things, guys. Very simple and very minor things. You don't need to be trained. You don't need to learn this in college. This is just a reminder. It's just simple logic. Always use spirit level after you're done. Whether the outer unit is on a bracket or, or on a pad, a rubber pad, whatever. Always use a spirit level. You need that oil to come back to the compressor and not trap elsewhere. So please keep that in mind, guys. Spirit level is, is your best tool, your best friend, in fact. Copper tube. When you're dealing with copper tubes, now mostly commercial jobs, they are using crimping, crimping tools. Residential, not really. You don't need crimping tool and invest lots of money. Just do, just become a pro in, 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 in flaring. Really. Flaring is your worst enemy, I know that. But if you use a little bit of compressor oil, your burr, your reamer, you know, the burning tools and all that stuff, everything will fall in place. No leaks. Everything will be good. Look at your flare. Look at your flare. Don't take them too much. Too wide is no good. Make sure it's even. When you lock it on your on your flaring tool, make sure it's even. That that what's pop pops out. These are all examples of badly shipped, dented, cracked, you know, surface damage. This is not a good example of doing jobs in the rain. First of all, when it's raining, in most cases, the humidity is like 100 100 
90 to 100 percent very high high humidity on that day especially when it rains so if you have no choice make sure you're very careful somebody is holding a tarp or or an umbrella no water should go into the into those pipes flush them out deep vacuum The wiring. Most of the time, guys are calling me H11. I have H11, guys. I I have H11 Paul. Most of the time, it's wiring. The wire has have, have been crossed from one to two, two to three. But in most cases, it's two and three that got crossed. So as soon as you power the unit, after a few minutes, you have an error code. I swear upon God, the wire was not cut. The wire was not joined. But unfortunately, the mechanical guy didn't do the wiring. It was the electrician who did the wiring. And he forgot to tell him. He forgot to, he forgot to tell the guy who did the piping work that the wire was joined. Please do not join these wires. Please do not join, especially the two and three. Because the two, is the common wire for one AC and two to three DC. Excuse me. So joining wires is a big mistake in life as far as heat pump is concerned. Never join these wires, go and get new wire. Then, your job is done, everything is, is ready to, to, to start. You need to do testing. You need to make sure that there is no leaks. When you applied nitrogen, you vacuum, everything is okay. Now you're testing the system and the system should operate the way you're, it is supposed to operate. If you're testing the system winter time or even sometimes summertime, open the grill a little bit and pour in some water just to make sure your drain is in good shape. Just to make sure that the drain is free, free flowing. Doesn't take you more than five minutes, man. Just get that, just get that water, slowly pour it into the evaporator, and off it goes out. And you're happy. The homeowner is happy, you are happy, everybody's happy. These are your pressures. Around, around 130 to 170. Now 170 is an overkill, especially when the house is super, super hot. But eventually it will settle at around 125, 130. In heat mode, we should not see more than 450. These are the good ranges between 350, 330, 350 to 4, 425. That means your system is working well. And for whatever reason, you are suspecting there is a leak. Or you're suspecting that the system has low refrigerant. Your best option and the only option is to recover all that refrigerant by weighing it. And once you find out that the system was low on charge, please, Charging new refrigerant. Do not use the same refrigerant that you remove. The composition is all messed up. So please charge in liquid 410 and it should be a, your new gas, not the same one that you remove. My records are showing that those guys who use the same gas, they were not successful. They were not very successful. So guys, more than 14.4 degrees Fahrenheit in cooling and 25.2 degrees in heating. When you're doing the, the, the delta T between intake and discharge. Intake air, discharge air. 
when the temperature of the room is at constant as well as the fan speed is at con constant level. So give it some time, let it run for five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and then do your measurement. Now let's talk a little bit of fixing these units. When you open up the, the grill on top, when you, when you lift the grill up, you will see there is a push button and there is a service uh, panel here. If you want to measure voltages, you got to open this cover. If you want to put the unit in test run, that's your button there. Press and hold for one beep is cooling, for two beeps is heating. Okay? Everything is mentioned in our service app or in our service manual. If you think you are full with Panasonic, you're going to do a lot of Panasonic, I would strongly advise you to download the app. It is helping a lot of guys out in the field and everywhere around the US and here in Canada. So please guys, the app is the best thing that you can have. The best thing that you can wish for. Some guys will call me and tell me the, the, the fan wheel is wobbling. The fan wheel is jumping around, bumping around. In most cases, on the left hand side, there is a bushing there. That bushing may have slipped out of, of the blower wheel shaft. All I'm asking you to do is open up the screw on the right hand side slide the blow wheel left to right right to left make sure it's nicely in and then tighten that screw again i can assure you that wheel will not bounce and if it bounces if it still bounces then make sure that bushing on the left hand side is not broken chances are that 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 bushing may have given way that's why the blow wheel is all over the place bumping around bouncing around and if that's not the problem, then the shaft of the motor is gone and needs to be replaced. To replace our motor is not difficult. Open up like four or five screws. You have access to the motor, pull it out, put a new one. Our motors very, very rare go bad. Our compressors, they go bad, but very rare, very rare. I have yet to see a compressor grounded. One or two compressors will come in here, seize. And we find out the pipe length was over 40 feet, and the guy forgot to add refrigerant. Or at some point along the way, there was a trap. So please avoid traps. And please make sure you add refrigerant depending on the model you're working with, you're working on. Most of our single zones, most, if not all of our single zones, 24.6. The unit is charged for 24.6 feet. Please don't do this. Purging the system after installation, soon after installation, by using the internal refrigerant, the refrigerant inside the system. Please don't do, do not do that. I came across this issue. That's why it's in the slide here. The guy did not have a vacuum pump, or the guy was just did not want to waste his time. So please, it's not good for the system. Every ounce, every milli ounce counts. In my first slides, I said the, the retrieving of the error code is super simple. You can use the homeowner to pull out, pull out the error code before you start your day. So that way you know what to figure out. 
I have this error code. Paul, tell me what is what is this error code means? What does it mean? Tony, what is this error code means? He will tell you. He will guide you in the right direction. But keep in mind, the power light should not be blinking. It's the timer light that blinks. If the power light blinks, there is no error. The unit is on standby. Some, if not all, may know what is what is the meaning of cold draft prevention or hot start. So when the green light blinks at the start of the of a heating cycle, that means the unit is on standby, waiting for the coil to get warm enough before the fan kicks in. Nobody likes cold draft, trust me. So that's when the green light blinks. So please don't make unnecessarily trips. People have made trips two hours drive because they thought the timer light was blinking. Instead, the power light was actually blinking. And when they got when they got to the job site, the homeowner said, "I'm so sorry, the unit is working fine. It was the the yellow light." the timer light and not the power light. So how do they do that? How do they retrieve that error code? All they do is take a toothpick or a pin or a prong, press that check button, not with your finger, guys. The picture there is a little bit deceiving with your finger, but you cannot put your finger because it's very tiny. So you need a toothpick. Press, press it for five seconds, Excuse me. The screen, your remote controller screen is going to show like that. And with your timer up and down, you are going to scroll. You're going to scroll until you hear a beeping from the window unit. Beep, 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 beep. Stop right away and look at your remote controller and see what the error code is. If you want to be sure, you can always scroll all the way because we have only two letters, H and F. H11 right up to H99 and F11 right up to F99. So all you do is scroll again and see if it's beeping at the same error code. Also remember, this unit stores only one error code only one error code and it's the latest error code so please don't try and retrieve error codes when when the system was working fine if you decide to retrieve any error code that is there that could be of somebody else's or it was stored there for a while make sure you retrieve it you clear it and once you clear it Start the system again. After a repair, timer light will not blink. The last error code will be stored in the IC memory. So please keep that in mind that that error code, even though you fixed it, it's still in the memory chip. You need to erase it before you take off. And it's so easy to erase it. All you do, all you do is press that push button there. It, it will beep once, and after it beeps once, you, pe you press the check button. And that's about it. Let's say you don't have a phone, you don't have a manual, and you showed up. You're still covered. Why? Because there are error codes here. There is a sticker on the right hand side inside the unit on this cover on this front grill that will tell you all the error codes there. How to erase the error code? There is that push button there. That same push button can be used temporarily when a, when a remote controller is missing or when a remote controller has no batteries 
or it's dead for whatever reason. You can use that push button. One button, one beat, press once and hold it. And you hear one beep, leave your finger, you're in cool mode. Two beeps, you are in heat mode. So you press that and hold for five seconds, you're good. After you're good over there, come come to your remote controller, press the check button for once, just one step, you will hear beep, and you're done. Your error code is er erased. That's your remote controller. To speak over there. RC. You can reset the you can reset the R, uh, remote controller if you think the remote controller is acting up. It's acting up weirdly. You're pressing something, something else shows, and you name it. And the battery is brand new. You're telling me you can get away sometimes by pressing the RC. Uh, button day by using a toothpick to reset the system sorry to reset the remote controller do's and don'ts okay do's and don'ts you know it but we are here to remind you two things okay always when you're drilling a hole going out keep it at a slant always keep it at a slant the outer unit, please don't hang it way up in the air. You are going to give yourself just a headache, just headaches and pain. Then the service guy comes, he's all alone, nobody to hold his leather and stuff like that. You're giving him more headaches because now he has to open up everything, he has to check and all that stuff. So please, always when you're installing our units and anybody's units, always remember your service guy and if you are the service guy always think about yourself there's no there is no harm in thinking of others if you have to tools always clean them always wipe them I know you're busy. I know you're super busy. And that's why I thank you for joining me earlier. Because you guys are busy right now preparing for summer in most parts of the of your country. Most states are preparing for summer, if not all. So always keep your tools ready. Change that oil, that vacuum pump oil, trust me. Just like your car engine. You can only go so much miles, uh, thousands of miles, and, and you've got to replace that oil. Same thing with your vacuum pump. The viscosity, the, the strength of that oil goes bad, becomes weak. And you are saying, how come there is no leak and I cannot get down to 500? What's wrong? It's because of that oil. So please. Keep replacing that oil, it's not expensive. These are a few things I'm reminding you guys. These are the few things that I'm reminding you guys, if you forgot. Tape measure, your spirit level. It's always important to have it. You need everything aligned, you need everything straight. Your back pad has to be straight. You have, it has to be level for condensation to look good. It needs to look good. Once again, it has to be on a slope, guys. It has to have a slope. Put enough of, enough of screws. Make it nice and tight. Nice and square, nice and flat. 10, 12 anchors, put, put them. Two here, two here, one there, two on top, two on top, you know, one and two in the middle, 
and one here. 10, 12 is more than enough. Make it nice and tight. You don't want that rattling. You don't want that rattling because when the unit, when the inner unit is packed with refrigerant, is filled with refrigerant, when the unit is running and cooling and heating, you name it, it's heavy. It becomes heavy. Because when you're mounting it, it's, it has no refrigerant. But once the refrigerant comes in, especially in cooling, liquid, it's really, really hot. i uh, sorry, heavy. Tools. I keep reminding guys, tools. So important. How do you need? Make sure it's anchored. You don't want it to be vibrating. You will, you will crack the pipe down the road. You will definitely crack your pipes down the road. When the pipe is too long, don't forget. Don't forget to add refrigerant. Most of our guys, they know they need to add refrigerant. Some guys, they, they forget. Or maybe that day, they did not have refrigerant with them. They said they will come back later. And that, and that was it. Guess what's going to happen? That compressor is going to get hot. Because coal vapor is not coming back to the unit. And the compressor is overheating. Eventually, you have an F97 error code. Compressor overheat, H97. Uh, sorry, F97. Why? Refrigerant. Piping is, piping is like 46 feet. No additional gas was, was added. This style is not good. You know that. So please don't forget to think about the units, how they're going to be placed. If it's a big project, always go and visit the site. Take pictures. Show your project manager, whatever, whoever he, he may be. Wiring, proper wiring connection. Make sure it's nice and tight. Obviously, you're not going to use your drill, your, your drilling machine here to tighten the screws. You better use your hand. Hand is way better than your drill. Why connection without joining? It's a risk. It's a fire risk, guys. No matter how tight the joint is. Please do not join those wires. It's not only a fire risk, but also a communication problem, a communication risk. Every two or one week, you'll get a nuisance call. Tony, William, Sean, I have this problem. You go there to the site, you, you reset the power, everything is up and running. There is a joint somewhere. Somebody has put a marade. Somebody has put a condensate pump and made all kinds of connection. Avoid those kind of connections, guys. Terminal blocks, no need, no need. Please avoid that. Do it once and do it right. You will never go back again. You will only go back for more jobs. These are the results. Preparation for tools, preparation for piping. Burn, always remove all the garbage. Banders, make your job neat. Make your job look nice and neat, guys. You need a nice band. When you're going left, right, coming down, inside the unit, outside, whatever. Flaring and bending is so important. You don't want kinks. Even if you have a slight kink, avoid it before you take off. Get rid of that kink, please, because it's going to affect the efficiency. The compressor will work too hard. It's like your blockage in your system. Your heart is going to, it's going to overwork hard. So please, kinks are not acceptable.
See what happened there? The guy used his knee or elbow, and that's what happened. The outer shell looks nice. The outer casing, the armor flex insulation looks good. But look what's inside. All this is not good. It's going to reduce the flow here for no reason. So please avoid that. Flaring tool. These are your best friends. Badly shaped, too wide. You will know exactly when it's too wide because the nut will not come out easily, will not slide slide through easily to, to, to tighten the, uh, the connection, to make your connection. So make sure you get some training and the training person is yourself. Grab 10 small pieces, cut them and flare, keep flaring all day. If you're a new, if you're a new guy in the trade, that's how I learned. I just kept flaring and flaring. I have units installed 20, 16, 15 years ago. No issues, no leaks whatsoever. All because of practicing. Brazing, mostly in residential application, very rare to use uh, brazing, very rare. But if you have to use, always remember, you need to control the, uh, a good flame as well. You, you make sure that you don't have this garbage remaining there. That oxidization needs to be flushed out. You need to flush them out. Nitrogen is your best friend when you're doing brazing. Nitrogen is your best friend regardless. But when you're brazing, make sure you pass through that so that nothing stays back. Because I'll tell you, in all heat pumps, we have strainers, meshes inside each and every corner, just inside, just before the accumulator, just before the electronic expansion coil. Just after the condenser outlet, there are strainers everywhere. If that thing goes there and gets stuck, you are in trouble. The unit will not perform. The system will pump down. So please, guys, nitrogen is important. Brazing is important. But make sure you use it when you are brazing. Make sure you have nitrogen for pressure testing. You have enough of nitrogen. If it's a small system, do not overpressurize it because you will just damage the valves of the unit and the unit is going to leak the 410 that came from the factory. And when it leaks, then you have a problem and you will blame, you will blame nobody but the manufacturer that the system came with lack of refrigerant. So please keep that in mind, guys. Sometimes the systems do come from the factory with less refrigerant, okay, guys? But it is very, very rare. Very rare. <clears throat> Make sure the pipes that you're using are always sealed. If it's, if it's a long pipe, but not a roll, it was used before, make sure you seal them, or else you'll have all this stuff. Clog strainer, compressors overheating like crazy. Pressures are not good. It is so simple to, to, to find out this problem. Wrenches, adjustable wrenches. Most of our guys, I see them use that. And they know they are feeling they know their strength but i'll tell you that's a guessing work you can use it to some extent and then avoid it to over tighten 
because you're going to cause trouble. Your best bet is to use this tool. This tool is not too expensive. It is not too expensive for the main for the money we are making. And even if you're make, if you're not making that money, you need to use the right tools for the right purpose. This thing is not going to lie lie to you. It's going to give you the correct talk. And everything and everything is indicated in our installation manual. It's given in newtons, it's given in foot pounds, you name it. So please use it. You can use your wrenches, no problem. But eventually use that guy. Torque wrench, electronic torque wrench. Nowadays we have electronics. We are into, a, into, into the electronic world. Beautiful. When you're working, when, it, when it's raining, always remember, keep at the back of your mind, always when, there's a, when, when it's raining, humidity is at its, at its best. It's at 100%. So make sure you do a lot of vacuuming. Like instead of doing 45 minutes, go longer, longer than one hour to get rid of all the moisture possible in that system. You can sweep the pipes with, 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 with nitrogen to get rid of some of the moisture. Vacuum pump, make sure it's, it has new oil. This is how you do it. 540 is on a big system. Don't go to 540, guys. 540 is too much. 400 is enough. 540, if you have a big system and lots of indoor heads, possibility of leaks, yes. But on a small system, I understand pressure is pressure. 540 is 540, 400 is 400. I understand that. But where there's less possibility of leakages, use less amount of PSI. This we spoke about, your temperature difference. Always keep that in mind. Spend some time. It's better, to, it's better you spend more time trying to fix the problem than running away to another job site and then you have to come back again because your troubleshooting was incomplete. This morning I told a guy, spend one hour. At least you will catch the problem rather than running to, to, to your next job site and hoping for the best. That's not how we do it. You need, if the customer is saying it goes into defrost cycle every, every 20 minutes, that's not true because our system is programmed for every hour, every 50 minutes to be, to be precise, the system goes into defrost and you will not get another defrost cycle for the next 50 minutes. So if the customer or homeowner is saying that they're getting two defrost cycles in less than 50 minutes, don't tell them it's not true. They're going to get upset with you. But you can tell them that's not what the system has been programmed for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend 50 minutes here to see how long this system is going to go into defrost and how many times. So please, on a defrost call, on a lack of refrigerant call, on those kind of calls, you have to spend time. You have to spend at least an hour. If, if, if need be, if you're allowed even longer, the better. So that way you don't come back. No callbacks. I didn't say that there are no callbacks. There are callbacks, especially in our trade. But you can minimize those callbacks. Always way in, way out. Never use the same refrigerant that you pulled out. Please, never use it. I don't trust that refrigerant. 
put in new gas, put in the gas that you trust, that you know it's brand new. So please remember to weigh in and weigh out. That way there is no gas in business. Topping out, topping up is not a good idea. If you want to do it for testing purpose, go ahead and do it. But eventually you need to recover and recharge brand new gas and weigh it in, please. This is one of the pictures I, I was sent by my guys, by, by people like you. You all send me this. What is this going on, Paul? The system went into deep frost and, and look at it at the bottom here. The entire coil from top to bottom was nice and clear. But here, here at the bottom, it tends to, to hang around. And mind you, this system has a drain pan heater. It has a base pan heater. And yet it, it, it caused that problem. In most cases, if not all, it's the refrigerant. It's slightly low. So when it's doing the frost, there's not enough of hot gas to melt everything. In few, case, in few cases, it could be the drain, the base pan is defective. In some cases, it could be the humidity as well. So you have to, you have to cover all those angles before you condemn the unit. This job, this job was eventually low on gas, but this job was not low on gas. When I looked at the picture, I could tell it that this unit was not going into defrost. This unit, did not go into the frost cycle. I had asked the guy, open the unit and check if the sensor was out of place. And right enough, the sensor came out of the well. And if it was a brand new unit, I would say the factory forgot to put it in. And if it's a unit that has been working for a while, chances are something maybe went there, a, a piece of wire got in, pulled, pulling the wire or something like that, the weld came out. The sensor came out of the weld. Look at this. This is outside my office. This is outside my lab. The, the lab where I used to do, where I'm testing all the systems here in real time. This was, this was in February. Always remember to tell the homeowner to clear that snow. Treat these units just like your driveway. Treat these units just like your driveway for better performance. For your driveway, you don't want to sleep and fall. For your units, you want good performance. You want good heat inside. This, this kind of load on top of the unit might prompt an early uh, defrost cycle. Maybe it, it was a warm day, but that snow got accumulated on top and nobody got time to remove it because they were hoping it would melt, but it didn't melt. So you please make sure you tell them to get rid of it. Like this. Clear it before and after. This is, this is the front of the, of the unit. At the back, by opening this cover, you will get access to electronic expansion valve. So this is how our unit looks like. This is a 24,000, our 12, 15, all looks the same. In terms of opening, when you open, you've got to open the front cover to troubleshoot. Pump down. If you open the cover over here, there are these two pins that are not insulated or not coated with this waterproof coating. <clears throat> those are meant for pumping down the unit. You can use those two pins by shorting if you feel like doing that way. But there is another way of pumping down by, lock, by closing the liquid line, turning on the unit in cool mode. But if the homeowner is not at home, 
then you want to pump down the system and and save some time pump by shorting those two pins even if the unit was in cooling uh, was in heating the unit is going to reverse and go into cooling and the pump down will begin and that's it by the time the homeowner comes your pump down is is done you may have maybe the job was supposed to be relocate the unit and and, and the process starts and you can save time that brings us to the end of our single zone session now without wasting time i'm going to i'm going to jump into our uh multi zones okay i'm going to jump into our multi zones and uh and soon we will talk about the error codes and and those kind of things okay share oh, gosh. sorry Okay. Are we are we in in a presentation mode guys? Yes, no, maybe. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, guys, today I'm going to talk about our five zone. And I'm going to talk about our five zone, but it applies the same with other zones. And there are a few things I'm going to point out that makes us different from other manufacturers, okay? Oh, is everything okay? Uh, Pal, it looks like your presentation went down. Oh, Just make sure you get Sorry. into presentation mode. How is it now? How is it, pal? Are we um, are we good? You're not in presentation mode. I see your presentation, but not in presentation mode. Resume slideshow. Hold on. Sorry, guys. This is this file is too heavy. That's why I'm having uh, delays. Are we good? Uh, Are we there? No presentation at all. Hold on. Are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I mean that mode. Uh, a bit heavy this file. I added a few things, you know. So, okay, hold on. Pally How about now? Uh, no. How about, How about you unshare your screen? Are you sharing your screen? Hold on, hold on. Am I there? No.
the funny the funny the strange part is i don't even okay here yeah. sorry 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 now now i'm going to share okay okay there we go now can you get in presentation mode yeah hold on thank you everyone i'm sorry about this inconvenience there we Are go we okay move on yep okay once again sorry guys for wasting like two three minutes but uh we'll catch up just like the pilot says <laughs> Uh, okay, so I was talking that I'm going to talk to you about our five zone, but our five zone basically is the same like the three, the two, and the four zone. The logic behind that is the same. All what you have to think about is the minimum and maximum capacity for our two zone, our three zone, our four zone, and our five zone. There are a few things that I wanted to talk to you about that makes us different from the other guys. And and we, and as we go along, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. Then we'll talk about uh, something called the error codes. Okay? I didn't speak anything about the error codes in our single zone because most of the error codes, if not all, except for two, are the same. Whatever error codes are in the multi zones, you can see them in the single zones as well, except for the two error codes, which I will remind you later what are they about. Okay? So 36,000 cents stands for the capacity, guys. 5E stands for five zone. So if you had a two zone, our two zone is 2E18. Our three zone is 3E19. Our four zone is 4E24. And our five zone is obviously a 5E36,000. Minus five stands for outdoor operating conditions. It can operate down to minus five without any issues. This compressor, unlike the single zone, they have a crankcase heater, okay, to keep the oil, the, the oil always warm and toasty. Remember, our five zone, you can put five units. But if you don't want to put five units and you call Tony and ask, hey, hey, Tony, I want to put two units. No problem. You can put two units, but you cannot put one unit. All our multi zones have a minimum of two in the units, respecting the minimum and maximum capacity. Where will you find that? You will find that in our catalog. You will find that in our service manual. You will find that on our website. So in this five zone example, we have a 4.5 as our minimum kilowatts and 17.5 as our maximum, which means you cannot go below 4.5 and you cannot go above 17.5. You will get a, an error code of H14, sorry, H12 capacity error. So the five, is 1.6 the 7 is 2.2.0 kilowatts the 9 is the 2.5 the 12 is 3.2 and so forth so if you are worried about kilowatts i have this this simple uh, conversion one kilowatt is 3412 bts per hour okay so please keep in mind guys a minimum of two indoor units must be connected. If you do not connect that, you are in trouble. The system is not going to run. Besides the two indoor units, you have to maintain minimum and maximum capacity. Now, in this case, the first, the first incident, the guy put two sevens, it did not work. Why? Because it was only four kilowatt. And here we are asking for 4.5 and above. They put a 9,000, two 9,000, we were fine. But please, don't buy a huge outdoor unit for two small indoor units, unless you have a plan that you will, you will be adding down the road. That is good, no problem. You can add as, as you move along, as long as you don't cross your maximum capacity. And if you have any questions about capacity combination, always reach out to us always reach out to wea they will guide you the way it's you are supposed to be guided 
assumption is not a good idea. Recently, we introduced legally approved. When I say legally approved, meaning warranty kicks in. You can put our three zone. You remember I mentioned we have a two, three, four, and a five zone. Only a, our three zone right now has been legally approved to install the single zones WKUA, which means they can be mixed and match with the WKUAs. No problem. As well as the RKUAs. So the existing units are the RKUAs, and now they have been added with the WKUAs. So no problem. Okay, guys. Again, I don't expect I, I don't expect you to understand everything what I'm talking today. But we are just a phone call away. So please keep that in mind. You can you can install a mixture of wall mounted, ducted, and cassette easily without any issues whatsoever. This is this is the biggest difference when we when you when you compare with our competitors. All other guys they run the size of the indoor units to the outdoor unit and then they make changes at the outdoor unit. In our case, it's the opposite. Especially for the 7, 5, 9, 12, and 18. You will upsize it at the indoor unit as far as the 12,000 and the 18,000 is concerned. Because all the ports, all the service ports, the, the gas line, sorry, the gas line and the liquid line is quarter inch and three eighths. Quarter inch and three eighths. So if you have a 12,000 and an 18,000 in a system, you will run from the outer unit, quarter inch and three eighths, all the way to the indoor unit and use one of these adapters that will upsize from three eighths to half inch. You will use this. You will use this guy from three eighths to half inch. Okay. In, in an event that you have a 24,000 BTU, guys, in an event that you have a 24,000 BTU, print sharing is now paused. Not sure. Anyway, guys, you can see clearly. I was talking about. I was talking about the adapters. Please remember that all our outdoor unit suction and liquid lines are quarter inch and three eighths. For the 12 and 18, you will use one adapter. For the 24,000, you will use two adapters. You will use one adapter at the outdoor unit to reduce from half inch to three eighths, and one adapter at the indoor unit from half inch to five eighths so please remember the rest of the models five seven nine you don't need to use any adapters because it's three eighths and quarter so that's pretty straightforward now clearance clearance and and allowances always remember you cannot just go crazy you, you cannot just put pipes all over the map there is a minimum and maximum Minimum of 10 feet, a maximum of 82 feet. Mind you, we are talking about multi zones. Okay? Always remember when you're looking at minimum and maximum pipe length, always refer to the manual that you that comes with the unit that you purchased. This is for training purpose and to keep you informed that there is minimum and maximum pipe length. And also, there is a pipe length. That you don't need to add refrigerant. For example, in this case, this model 36,000 BTU unit has been charged for 147.6 feet. If you cross that land, no problem. As long as you do not cross 262 feet and you don't cross 82 feet per indoor unit. You will have to add refrigerant and it's 0 0.2 ounces 
פחות. Mind you, when you're working on a single zone, it's a different story. On a smaller capacity models, it's 0.2. On a bigger, it's 0.33. So again, the model you are working on, always remember, please always remember to make sure you are referring to the manual you're working on. If you have any questions, you dump, somebody dump the, the manual for whatever reason, give us a call. Give us a shout. High difference. Always keep in mind high difference. When outer unit is located at the top side, the bottom of the outer unit to the bottom of the indoor unit, the last very bottom indoor unit has to, has to be within 49 feet or less. 49 feet is more than enough especially on a residential application commercial application you might struggle you will have to look for a bigger size unit and then when the outer unit is located on the upper side you need to have 24 feet from the topmost indoor unit to the bottommost indoor unit this is my style Based on my experience of heat pumps industry for many, many years now, I like this style because it's an average spot. Every indo unit, every indo unit in most cases are equal in pipe length from the indo to the outdoor, indo to the outdoor. Because remember, the further the indo unit, the longer it takes to heat up the place or cool the place. Obviously, it will cool and obviously it will heat. And once it gets enough of refrigerant, it will maintain that with, a, with no issues whatsoever. But again, based on my experience, I really, really prefer this application. Now, if you don't have choice, no problem. As long as you are within what is recommended in the manual. But if you can try, and if you have a scenario like this, this slide I'm showing you, try and keep this style. This is the best you can think of. It will last you for a longer period of time, more than 10 years. So they are your five zones. Every indoor unit has an electronic expansion valve. Every indoor unit, every out, every indoor unit has its own electronic expansion valve indicated as A, B, C, D, and E. Do not cross the pipes. Do not cross the wires. Zone A goes to A, zone B, C, and D goes respectfully to its zone. And remember, when you're installing these units in heating, uh, sorry, in wintertime, where they will not use cooling, you can get away if you cross those wires or pipes. But I'll tell you, come summer and the unit is in cooling, the customer is going to call you. I have F17 or H39 error code. Those are the two error codes that when you call us and you tell us I have an F17 or an H37, uh, sorry, H39, I will tell you right away, or Tony's gonna tell you right away, it's a multi-zone unit, correct? Yes, you have crossed your wires, my friend. But, but how come? But how come? But how come it went all, all, all winter? Because, those two error codes are cooling related error codes. They are not heating related error codes. So please always keep that in mind. And we have valid proof, practical, hands on, live proof that when the guys they cross those wires, they had these issues. So please always focus when you're doing those connections. So sometimes we have a problem. One guy will do the piping, another guy is doing the connection, and then the third guy is doing the wiring. I would suggest you, all your three guys should be at the site on that day, or else you'll have callbacks. And I'll tell you, callbacks is normal, but 
can be avoided. And I'll tell you one thing, callbacks kills your profit, takes away all your profit. Because you promise that customer that you will give them labor, free of labor for many, many years. So please guys, do it once and do it right. Tdx, there are thermistors all over the place. There are thermistors on the suction line, there are thermistors on the liquid line, there are thermistors on the uh, on the coil outside, ambient, defrost in, defrost out, there are thermistors everywhere. All those thermistors are talking to each other using the EEPROM. The EEPROM is the brain of the outdoor PCB and the indoor PCB. They are communicating all the time and they have been programmed from the factory to talk to each other. When to bring in your defrost cycle, when not to bring in your defrost cycle, when to initiate the defrost cycle, when to terminate the defrost cycle. So always keep it in, keep that in mind. And always remember, if you have a defrost cycle issue, always make sure you are present. You are present in front of the unit and time it. Time it. We need how many minutes that unit went for and how many units the unit went in the, into the frost cycle before it got out of the frost cycle. And I'll tell you one thing, that the frost cycle has to clear the coil. And if it does not clear the coil, we have a problem. And, and, most, and in most cases, the problem is low on refrigerant. That picture there is not easy to see, but if you can see, that's your outdoor unit PCB. All those guys there are your sensors, your terminal blocks, motorized valves, solenoid valves, four-way valves, electronic expansion coils. We have a noise filter. We have a control board, power board. In our service manual or on our, or, or on our app, our service app, you will find this chart very easy. If you need, if you need to download your the the, the Panasonic uh, service app, uh, we will uh, uh, Tony will guide you. It's pretty safe, it's pretty simple, and it's pretty cool. Our thermistors very rare go bad. Our thermistors, I can tell you once again, very rare go bad. 10 years and above, I can suspect a, tens a sensor going weak, but not below that. Compressor. When you think you have a problem with the compressor, maybe it's burnt, grounded, which I have not, which I have yet to see. The windings have to read equal 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.1 are considered as a balanced uh, uh, ohm reading. The ohms should be equal because remember, as I mentioned earlier, that this compressor is a three-phase compressor. So the ohms have to read the same. This is not like a standard compressor back in the day where it has a start and run windings. This is different. That's your service PCB there. The service PCB does what? I'm going to tell you, explain to you what you need to worry about and what you don't need to worry about. What you need to focus on and what you don't need to focus on. That's your service PCB there. You can play with it when you have the chance or when you have the time, which is very rare. But if you have that, you can go and play with it and it does many things. One of the things it does, the pump down. It can pump down when you need to pump down the system. How you do it? You wait, you press and hold for five seconds, the system kicks in. Make sure your liquid line is closed. The compressor is gonna work in fixed frequency. It's gonna to run to the maximum and all the indoor units, 
if they were in heat mode, they will go into cool mode. So you don't need to go to each and every indoor unit to change modes unnecessarily. You can do it from outside, from the outdoor PCB, which is in front of the terminal block on the left hand side. Very easily accessible. All the expansion valves will fully open. Compressor is going to run at the maximum frequency. And all in the units, as I just said, are going to be in cool mode. Because remember, to pump down, you have to be in cool mode. Those are the LEDs that they're going to indicate the time left. Three minutes, three LEDs are indicating, are flashing. Two minutes, two LEDs. One minute, one LED, and finally it ended. So you're going to be quick. You're going to be super fast to make sure you're ready to close the gas line. You don't waste, you don't waste any refrigerant hanging around in the indoor unit. Then we have the cancellation. For some reason, you made a mistake. You don't want to pump it down anymore. You can cancel it by pressing that same switch again. You press it once and you're done. Test run. Please don't use this test run when you're done with the job. This job of test run is good when you're trying to troubleshoot things like low and gas, uh, thermistor issue, and stuff like that. Because if you're going to do test run on a brand new startup, it may not bring up a fault when you are in when you are in heat mode. Because when you are doing test run heating, especially winter time, all the units will run, will perform well. You will say, wow, everything is working fine, you're good. You cancel the test run, you hand over the remote controls, you go down the road after two hours, three hours, the homeowner is calling you that one light is flashing. Because for some reason, they switched over to cooling, and now you have a cross wire. And because you have a cross wire, the, the one unit that was not supposed to run is getting flow of refrigerant and it's freezing. The coil is frozen and F17 is going to show up. We'll talk about the error codes later, but that's how it is. So forced cooling and forced heating is good, but use it for testing uh for, for for troubleshooting sorry use it for troubleshooting purpose don't use it for commissioning commissioning the best way to do is one unit at a time run one unit at a time make sure it runs for at least five ten minutes you're happy shut it off go to the next unit and when i say shut it off shut it off with, by using your remote controller i'll tell you one thing you will never get a call back of crosswire do that style, and that's it. This is one thing that I would not like you to use it. It is there. I would suggest you don't waste your time to, to find out if you have a wiring check. It's going to eat up, eat up your time for no reason. The one unit at a time testing is the best way of testing it and the fastest way. Because this wiring goes through the process and it takes a long time. So please, wiring check is there. If you want to do it, do it. It's, it's, a, it, it's up to you really. But based on my experience, I don't want to use it. I don't like using it. Because it, it can rectify a minor problem. And that problem can come back again after a long two, three day power outage. So please. Avoid using the wiring check. Power save. Power save is a good feature, but again, you're going to compromise on the capacity. You're going to make the, the unit sound a little bit uh, less, less noise. The, de the decibels is going to reduce a little bit. You're going to save some, some energy, but at the same time, you're compromising on the capacity. So if you're buying a, a big unit, you're spending a lot of money, why, why you want to do power save? Again, if the outer unit 
is is way bigger than the inside unit, you can use that power save button, no problem. Slide it, slide it, and you're good. Then we have the priority, the priority mode. Priority mode is given to the unit with the highest capacity. So if there is an 18,000 and a 12 and a, and a 9,000, priority mode is given to the 18,000 automatically after you select that switch. When you select that switch, the board, the outdoor unit knows I have an 18,000 here and I'm going to make it a priority. What does that mean? That means that if the 18,000 unit was running in heating and the 12 and the, eight and the 9 was also running in heating, but you all of a sudden occupy, occupying that room that has an 18,000 and you want to switch over to cooling, you have the priority to do that. You can switch over to cooling and the rest of those other two guys are going to be on standby. If you bought this heat pump and you want to do cooling only, you have that option. Cut off the jumper and you're in cool mode. Down the road, sometime down the road, some years down, down by, a new tenant has come in and wants heating, put back the jumper, solder it, and you're up, you're up again as a heat pump. No need to remove four way valves and, and unplug this and unplug that. No need. Just cut that jumper. It's it's a straight wire. Cut it off. You're in cooling. Someone wants it back. Join it back by using a solder. A soldering iron. Let's talk about error codes now. H11. H11 is our common error code. On a brand new system, I can bet you it is crossed wiring. <laughs> if you cross your wires, H11 is going to pop up right away. But if you tell me, or if you tell Aunt, uh, Tony that this system has been running for a long time, most likely, I would say 90% is the outdoor PCB. Check the outdoor PCB. And it's so easy how to check whether it's the outdoor problem or the indoor problem. All you do is go to the app and it will guide you. But today, I will explain to you how to do it. You remove number three wire on the communication line. Remove the number three wire, obviously the power is off. Remove the number three wire, power back the unit, and measure between number two and the, and the screw of number three. If it's not fluctuating, that means the outdoor PCB is bad. Another way of doing it is also very easy. When you turn on the unit, and if you don't hear the clicks, the in most cases, it's the outdoor board. Those clicks come from the electronic expansion valves, and they're not getting power because the outdoor, outdoor PCB is dead. But there's a way of testing it by using this multimeter. Please. Do not use an m meter, or else you will see the voltages all over the place. If you're measuring a thermistor, if you're measuring a four-way valve coil, please do not use an m meter. Use a multimeter. It will fool you. And I, I, and I have a live uh, scenario where I, I, I had uh, misdiagnosed a system because the, the guy at the job site was using an m -probe. And it was giving us wrong readings. So please use a multimeter when you're doing a communication uh, check and when you're checking thermistors and coils. And if you're measuring running amps, then obviously you need that amp probe. H12 is when you undersize or oversize. Okay? Back in back back in the day when when single zones could not uh, work with multi zones, that could also happen, but not at the moment because most of our in, our single zones are talking now to the outdoor units. So please keep in mind, H12 is more focused on maximum or minimum capacity. H15, I have never heard about this error, but guys, it can happen, and if it happens, it's a faulty sensor or a, a faulty outdoor PCB.
H16 has happened once, twice with me, and it was the compressor not pumping. The compressor pumping power was very poor. So please keep that in mind. Even if it says a current transformer has been detecting and all that stuff, or outdoor PCB, mostly it's the number three, low compression. If the compressor is running, hook up your gauges and see if you can see any movement. If the pressure gauges are not moving, definitely it's your compressor gone. H27, ambient, th ambient thermistor, very rare, but it can happen. H32, very rare, but again, it can happen. H33, low voltage. H33, I had this problem when the indoor unit and outdoor unit was supplied by 120 volts AC. The guy saw it was a 9,000. I think it was the electrician. He said, ah, 9,000, it's a small unit. I think it's just 120 volts without looking at the nameplate. He wired it and he took off. Next day, the homeowner is complaining. Check H33. Check the voltage, 120. H36 again, very rare, but it can happen. And please download the app. It will really, really help you. H97, very popular winter time. Very popular winter time because snow got into the unit, a lot of snow, and the, and the pen blade is not moving. There is no feedback pulses to the board. And after three minutes or less than three minutes, the outdoor unit stops, tries again, stops four times, H97. H98 is a hidden error code. A hidden error code meaning the system will not shut down. And if it shuts down, if you tell me, Paul, Anthony, the system shut down and I'm getting H98, that means the system is truly dirty. It's clogged, the air filter is clogged, there's a lot of dust, there is some kind of short cycling or something like that. But normally, H98 in most cases is a hidden error because the indoor unit, maybe there is only one indoor unit running out of the three or four, and the outdoor unit is a big unit, is a 36,000. The capacity is not enough to handle. The pressure goes up and the unit shuts, the outdoor unit shuts down and comes back on again. So that can happen, but if it's on a brand new system, maybe one unit was running and the other two were switched off. H99 is not a heat mode error. It's a cool mode or a dry mode error. So if you tell me, Paul or Anthony, I got, a, I got an error, H99, and I was running it in heat mode, it will be very hard to believe, but we will take your word. But in most cases, if not all, this H99 has been programmed to run only in heating or, sorry, in cooling or in dry mode. And that is because the coil got super cold below 34 degrees Fahrenheit. It is getting closer to zero and it shuts down. In less than one hour, the system shut down for more than three times. Eventually, it's going to lock out. A few phone calls that I got last summer on H99, the system was low on refrigerant. Some units, they cross 25 feet. Some units, just low on refrigerant. I don't know how it happened. They had to recover and recharge. And no, no issues whatsoever. F11. F11 is a four-way valve problem, but only on new systems. If, if, it's, if it's on an old system, definitely the indoor pipe thermistors are weak. The indoor pipe thermistors are weak. You're calling for heat. The thermistor is not sending signal to the board to tell the unit to switch over to heating. And that's when it shuts off on F11. And if the system is new, nothing wrong with the thermistors, then go outside, open up the unit and see, maybe the four-way valve plug got loose and came out. Very rare, but it can happen. 
F-17 is what I was talking to you about. When you cross your wire, when you cross your wire, this is what happens. You are trying to start Indo unit A, but the refrigerant is going to Indo unit B that is off. And that coil is going to freeze and shut down, and it's going to show F-17. The, wire, the, the supply has gone to unit A, the refrigerant has gone to unit B. F-17 is where you'll get the error code. F90, okay, F90 is either the outdoor board, low voltage, or the compressor. In most cases, whenever we had an F90, we tried to shut the power off for 10, 15 minutes, and it worked, no issues. F91, I can bet you, low on refrigerant. Refrigerant was low, the gas, the gas was not enough, and the system shut down. These are pictures from three different places, from three different regions that was low on refrigerant and shut down on F91. F93 is, it can happen, but in most cases, it's either the outdoor PCB, the compressor, or power reset for 15. 20 minutes and you should be good. I had one case so far with F93 and we found out that one of the Indo unit connections, the pipe was kinked. The pipe was kinked. Once he released that kink, put a new pipe, F93 disappeared. Because the system is shutting down on high pressure and, the, and it's forcing the compressor to run backwards. And that's when F93 happened. F93 and F94 are kind of related, very close to each other. So high pressure, clog, piping, kinks, you name it, short cycling is F94. Very rare, but it can happen, guys. F96, same story. If it happens, first, before you call anybody, shut the power off, not for three minutes, not for five minutes, for 10 to 15 minutes, please. We need everything to get discharged over there. F97, overheating. Mostly short of, of refrigerant. Very rare. Very little refrigerant though. Not too much. Too much normally will be F91. But a little bit of refrigerant, lack of refrigerant in the system will prompt you to F97. F98, very rare. But again, it can happen. F99, same story. Shut the power off for 10, 15 minutes and try it. You should get away with it. And guys, that brings us to the end of our two segments. Okay? I, I, want, I wanted to share something uh, on the, on the, uh, on the, what do you call, auxiliary heat. Let's see auxiliary heat. When we spoke about auxiliary heat, oh boy, sorry. Let me talk about a little bit about auxiliary heat. Auxiliary heat. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna join in for one second. The, there's gonna be an email sent out by the end of the day about the class you will receive a certificate in the email, a link to the recording of this class, 